want to speak a little bit about some recent tax development uh, within Israel and basically uh, tell you something about it. Uh, hopefully the discussion will be interesting to you. Now, if you can see my topic, the thing that I'm trying to discuss is basically based on the Game of Thrones, all right? I don't know if any of you have seen the show, but uh, I think that this is something which is really interesting. And maybe because of the huge success of this show, then uh, maybe because of that, uh, both the OECD and even Israel have decided to make some recent changes. And I would explain that as I go through the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with uh, the concept of base erosion profit shifting, uh, but this is going to be basically the main topic of discussion here. Now, so I just tried to explain the basic about base erosion profit, profit shifting. In October 2015, basically last year, the OECD came up with this huge reports and this reports related to tax evasion issues and because of a problem that they had which was mainly related to the digital economy okay now how do we define this problem okay you basically if uh, i assume that all of you know what the, what's the meaning of transfer pricing but uh, large multinationals, which are mostly US-oriented, uh, created some legal, and uh, this is a place to emphasize, they created some legal tax planning, and by this legal tax, tax planning, they were able to achieve a relatively low effective tax rate, which can be something in the range of 1% to 4% uh, as an average. Uh, now, most of these companies or companies such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, they did it purely legally and of course they have operations. They have operations in uh, Europe, they have operations in Asia, they have operations in the US. And we're going to even discuss the, uh, the types of tax, of tax planning uh, exercises that they did. But uh, the OECD started to get the feeling that are basically being screwed, so to speak, here. Because they, they have a lot of clients which support these multinationals. However, they can't uh, benefit from the taxes. All of the clients are there, but uh, the margin which is left in each country is relatively low. So this was the main reason for the entire process of the BEP project. Again, base erosion, profit shifting. And a lot of countries started to actually target the multinationals and try to attack and challenge these, uh, the, the, these types of tax planning. Israel is one of the first countries that uh, issued tax circulars and are trying to even come up with some legislative amendments in order to help the fight. The, the fight on the one hand with these multinationals, but on the other hand, there are even some proposed legis legislative amendments that are intended really on the other hand in order to attract investors to Israel, which are of the same type, or these of the same multinationals that one hand is trying you know, to assist and the other hand is trying to target. So these are basically will be the issues that I will try to discuss here. Now, just so you have a basic concept of, uh, of the tax planning which is offered, the basic tax planning idea which the BEPS is basically all about. This is the structure that uh, everyone challenges because, you know, in the US, technically, you can reach an effective tax rate of between 40 to 45 percent, including state tax. That's in theory. Okay? Yeah. Alright, that's in theory. Okay? Uh, however, if you create a proper tax planning, the US tax laws 
you can reach an effective tax rate which is really low. Okay, it can be between one to five percent, and you can easily reach it. And this is something which is justifiable in the U.S. This is the most crucial factor that we must all understand. The U.S. legislator is fine with everything. So basically, if he approved such a tax scheme, which will be the tax scheme that is seen in the next in the next in the next slide, okay? But now the OECD is targeting this part, then. I, I really view it as like some types of a game of thrones because we have a lot of houses and each house wants to get all of the income and to be in charge and to be the king. But basically we can even take a, the way that I see at least of the, the bet project is basically a way to take income which theoretically should be allocated to the US. But the US maybe by justifying these tax planning opportunities then maybe they waive these types of income. It's a question. And I think that this will be the next the next fight, which is going to be a world a worldwide phenomena. And this is something will definitely be keeping us all busy in the next five to seven years. That's for sure. Now the the Irish double sandwich, okay? Uh, this is the key example for such a tax planning, okay? Basically, you have a lot of operation, operating companies which are uh, in Delta, there is an activity that can be pursued on the ground in each and every company, such as Israel, Ireland, Germany, doesn't matter, and you perform like this simple election called the check the box election in the US to make these operating companies transparent for US tax purposes, and you are also putting in place two separate uh, companies in Ireland, okay? One is an Irish principal, which will serve as a, some type of a holding company, and the, the Irish principal's income is usually taxed at the rate of 12.5%, uh, but uh, on top of this company, you have a company which is a non-resident Irish corporation, okay? Uh, this is the entity which holds the IP. This entity is usually not subject to any taxes. And because it holds the IP of the entire group, most of the income is allocated to this off sort of offshore jurisdiction. Okay, so the Irish principal pays royalties. Other entities who are using the IP are also paying these royalties. And because most of these royalties are by the payment of these royalties, the IP, the IP company is receiving basically the main part of the income of the entire group and this is the exercise that enables uh, these multinationals to reach a really, really low effective tax rate. Now, uh, in the last couple of years and immediately after the OECD issued the reports on base erosion profit shifting, the tax world is in a turmoil, all right? We have a lot of decisions against Starbucks, against Apple, against Google, and against Amazon. Uh, the, 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 what they did to, like for example, if you see in the middle, uh, with respect to Apple, in this slide, there is a, no, what, what, they, what basically the EU did, it basically said, it, Ireland didn't do anything, okay? Ireland believed that what they're doing is legal and fine, but then the EU stepped in, and the EU told them, no, we believe that what you're doing here is uh, wrong, okay? It's uh, basically illegal aid, and uh, the EU Commission just ruled on August 2016 against Ireland, okay, and said that this aid was illegal, and therefore Apple should pay 30, 13 billion euros, all right? Which is like, this is something which is unprecedented. Okay, that's, and the process didn't happen only in, uh, only there, okay? Uh, even in, in the UK, now there is a legal process that every multinational will have to file tax returns in the UK, but this tax return will also have 
They, they will have to address each and every jurisdiction that they are existing and what's the, what's the effective tax rate in each jurisdiction. This is something which really hadn't happened before, okay? And uh, so it's really, I believe that we are in a very, very interesting era from, uh, at least from an international uh, tax standpoint. Now, Israel, of course, wants to be a part of it. And uh, maybe, and I think that it's really, really interesting to understand what's going on in Israel exactly in this respect, okay? Because first of all, there are two main aspects that these changes are relating to. The first one is value-added tax, okay? But I don't know if you know this, but in Israel, if you are if you're not if you're not an Israeli resident, okay, you usually you don't have to pay taxes, right? That's that's the regular concept. However, for VAT purposes, there is something which is unique. If you're a business, a trader, a sort of a dealer for Israeli VAT purposes, then every services that you receive from uh, persons who are residing outside of Israel are basically should theoretically be treated as an import of services. Now, this import of services should still theoretically not be, should be subject to Israeli VAT. Okay, this is the responsibility of the Israeli business. Now, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. I think that 90% of the businesses in Israel are not following this rule. Okay, it's a rule that exists in theory. In practice, I haven't seen a lot of people implementing it, and the VAT authorities do not always target and challenge these, uh, these businesses. Okay, however, what about private clients? Okay, private clients, uh, for private clients, there is a problem because they're not businesses. It's relatively hard for the VAT authorities to challenge them. So, for example, if you're a private client and you order books from Amazon, uh, theoretically you can get the books to Israel, but without paying Israeli VAT on that. Now, the Israeli legislator did not like that. So what they're basically trying to do is they're trying to amend the Israeli VAT law. And this amendment has yet to pass, okay? But it's something that may pass in the near future. And uh, what we're trying to do is to open a registry for all non-Israeli re re residents, such as multinationals, such as Amazon, or selling books, okay, they're just selling books to Israel. And let's assume that they don't have any operations in Israel. They will be required to be part of this special registry. Uh, it's not clear at this stage how this report will look like, or what will be written there, and of course, what, whether there will be some types of expenses that uh, these multinationals need to allocate. But uh, I expect this change to happen like within the next uh, year or so. Now, at least from the VAT standpoint, uh, this is not something new. Okay, this is the concept of uh, indirect taxes in Europe works in a very similar manner. So this is something which is relatively easy to, di to digest, I think, for all of these multinationals, but it's just a matter of, you know, to wait for it and see how it will unfold, and then decide how to go about it, and what would be the most efficient way to make this reporting. Currently, the, well, the, legisl the legislation, this proposed legislation, is general in nature, and, uh, but I think that this will change, and all of the ambiguities and inclarities will be clarified in the future. The most interesting thing on the Israeli tax side uh, is on the direct tax side, okay? Because we really, what we have here are really, really two separate directions which are all being flown from the authorities, okay? On the one hand, I think that this is almost an unprecedented proposed legislation as well, which is designated to assist, to attract multinationals, okay? Now, maybe without diving into too much details on this proposed legislation, you need to know that if you're a large multinational and you have a, 
if, and the group's income is more than 10 million per annum, 10 billion per annum, then you may qualify, assuming the IP will be in Israel, you may qualify to be treated as a special preferred technology enterprise, okay? And if you will qualify for that treatment, you can reach an effective tax rate in Israel of 6%. Now, this type of legislation, theoretically, should be BEPS compliant, okay? So, this is actually an attempt to attract the multinationals who may have now problems in Ireland and say, that, okay, look, we understand you have problems there. Come to Israel, it's a nice country, we have beautiful beaches, everything is great, a good business atmosphere, and you can benefit from a limited tax rate of only 6%. Now, the way this, this scheme actually works is that we're saying that, okay, but in order to do so, not only that the IP should be in Israel, but you need to have employees, actual employees in Israel, okay, to show that this is not sham, that this is actually uh, really operating business, 20% uh, of the employees should actually work in R&D, and uh, the other technical requirements that you don't need to remember them for purposes of this lecture, but remember that this uh, is something that may be introduced in the, in the really, really near future, and uh, I assume that some multinationals and a lot of multinationals hopefully will try to obtain the beneficial tax return, tax return here, and uh, enjoy from, uh, and of course we can do it with uh, obtaining tax rulings, but this is too early of a stage. Yeah. That's on the one hand, but on the other hand, something is something is something interesting is up is happening from the exact opposite direction. Okay, and this is like, and for me, this is something that you know I, I can understand, but uh, it maybe maybe it's a little bit funny. I don't know. You you guys can tell me maybe after the after the lecture in the question when I will ask you questions or when you can ask me questions. But uh, but the Israeli tax authority, on the other hand, issued a tax circular. Okay, what this tax circular is basically saying is. It's saying that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of a permanent establishment, but the permanent establishment, in three words, is either a fixed place of business that you have in the other country, and if you, if you are a multinational, a multinational, and you have a business operating in Israel, uh, and, you qualify, and you are treated as a, like a branch, so if you have a branch in Israel, then you must pay taxes in Israel and you must file Israeli tax returns. Now, a lot of times there is a question about the locations of servers. Okay, let's assume that you're a part of the digital economy. If you have servers in Israel and these servers are located in Israel, then through the, through the, loca through to the fact that the, the servers are, being, are located in Israel, then you may have a PE issue in Israel, okay? But the Israeli tax authority is trying to take the step, uh, to take the PE test one step further. And they're even trying to say now that, look, it doesn't matter if, uh, if you have a server in Israel. Because of, because of the digital economy, the fact that you have, that you are, uh, that they actually have a business and you have Israeli clients as a whole, it doesn't matter if you have a server in Israel or you don't have the server in Israel, because this is something that you can definitely control. And you can have a, and you can put the, the digital server outside of Israel. But for us, it doesn't matter, okay? And we're going to try and challenge you and maybe claim that you have a taxable presence in Israel. Now, I think that it may be, uh, maybe I, I will just try to guide you to show you this example so you understand this concept, okay? Uh, this example is actually based on uh, something which is happening at this stage, okay? One of my multinational clients is being targeted uh, by the Israeli tax authority. Now, in the case at hand, the, we have the multinational who is selling software products to Israel, okay? 
They don't have any taxable, the, the selling entity does not have a taxable presence in Israel. None, okay? This Israeli reseller is an unrelated party, okay? This is not a subsidiary of the multinational. This is a separate business partner of, the, of these multinationals. And what they're basically doing is they're just the, the buying the, the, some digital product, all right, of the multinational, and they're selling it for, to other clients, to Israeli clients that they have. That get the, and these clients can be some limited forms of multinationals as well, but these are unrelated parties, okay? And what the Israeli reseller does best, he knows how to implement the, the, the services to the Israeli clients, and this is a work that he's doing on his own. Okay, it's based on its own merits. It's not related to the multinational business at all. Okay? And the Israeli tax authority is trying to say that the Israeli reseller is a permanent establishment of the multinational. This is what they're trying to do. Now, at the beginning, when we started the discussions, I was basically shocked because this is against everything, every tax rule in the world, basically. This is against even things that are being written in the OECD. However, in Israel, when the reseller wants to sell, wants to pay for the, for the multinational, for the software products that it acquired, it is assuming that it is not treated as a special company, which is a company with a large turnover and other characteristics, it has to go to the Israeli tax authority in order to obtain an exemption certificate. Okay? So if you want to pass $100 outside of Israel, you need to go to the Israeli tax authority. If you get an exemption certificate, then you can run this, remit the payment of $100 to, the, to this multinational. However, if uh, now this is an opportunity for the Israeli tax authority to step in, and what they're trying to say is, okay, look, now since we believe that this is a permanent establishment, you will not be entitled to, the, to receive an exemption certificate here. So we will want to withhold. Now they have the authority to withhold up to 30% in these examples, which is a lot, okay? And so this is something that can create a turmoil and they're trying to abuse that. So we have a few discussions in the same nature going out throughout Israel. And this is something that will not be resolved in the, I think that in the next few months, but it will be a relatively long and tedious process. But for such an example, I don't see any chance for the Israeli authorities to prevail, okay? But what we can do, uh, here is maybe just uh, if to the extent that the Israeli tax authority will indeed insist on a certain withholding, so on a certain withholding amount, then my, my personal recommendation would be uh, basically to reach the worst case scenario, just reach, reach a trust arrangement with the Israeli tax authority, get a trustee, and have the amount in dispute sit with the trustee, and don't pay to the Israeli tax authority then the fight can be really, really harder, okay? Uh, but this is something that needs to be taken into account now. On the commercial side, what's also interesting is usually that these multinationals are protecting themselves, okay? Here, the multinational, that you see in this example, uh, usually the agreement with the reseller said that, look, any withholding, we don't care about it. You know, you need to gross it up. So, if you need to gross up the payment, let's assume that the Israeli tax authority said that there should be a 30% withholding, it's on you, okay? So the reseller now uh, will have to pay for it. And if the reseller has to pay for it, and usually the profit margins are less than 30%, then you, you can see straight, you can immediately assume that uh, he will not have any business justifications of uh, working. Now, but what would happen if there was no reseller, okay? Because if, at least for the portion of the services that is being uh, 
that, that is being actually sold by the multinational directly, if the Israeli client just, you know, is, just operates in front of the, of the multinational itself, then theoretically, uh, the, the interesting thing is theoretically that this is a situation that in accordance with the base erosion profit shifting rules can be targeted, okay? However, uh, practically speaking, the Israeli tax authority did not challenge such a, such a simple case, but they challenged the really, really hard case when you operate through a domestic reseller who has his own profit which is independent and there, uh, I think that it will be really hard to say that an independent business guy is uh, actually giving out money for a multinational that he does not have any shares in, alright? But uh, the next example, this is something that is actually also being, thinking about challenging it but in the Israeli tax authority but they didn't do so at this stage, okay? And usually this is the most common scenario. You have a multinational and he has an Israeli subsidiary, okay? This Israeli subsidiary usually works on a cost plus basis. It means that, uh, let's assume that the amounts which is drawn from the Israeli clients, and again, the Israeli clients will work with the multinational directly, and let's assume that the turnover is even $10 million per annum, okay? The only compensation for the Israeli subsidiary, which is not dealing with the clients directly in theory, all they do is provide some uh, pre-sale services and things like that, then uh, all the compensation would be their costs, plus the Israeli subsidiary's cost, plus a markup of between 7 to 10 percent, okay? This is something that uh, the base erosion profit shifting rules, both in the, under the OECD in general and in what the Israeli authority will try to do now, this is something that they will try to target. Because what we're going to say, look, we believe that the transfer pricing of the, which uh, said that you need to operate on a cost per 7 to 10 percent basis, is wrong. Because you have a lot of Israeli clients and you have a website and the website is designated for Israeli people as well. So we believe that the cost plus transfer pricing is wrong. Such tax, <coughs> such transfer pricing exercise is not uh, BEPS compliant. And if it's not BEPS compliant, it needs to be changed because the profits that we believe should be allocated to Israel should be much higher. Okay, but there is a question of authority. Because even within the Israeli tax authority, there are jurisdictions. So if you have the jurisdictions in which the Israeli sub belongs to, then that's fine, and that you have the authority to challenge it. But uh, if you are another payer's jurisdiction, what you basically will try to do is you will try to say that the multinational has a permanent establishment in Israel. Okay, I think we have, we have another topic, but I think that it may be too complicated for purposes of this uh, presentation. So again, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, either now or later on today or tomorrow. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, I had a good time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.